You're watching F1 Technical Analysis, brought to you by Aramco. Formula One has always been about technical innovation. But while the landmark technological leaps are celebrated, the new ideas that failed tend to be forgotten. Yet there are countless examples of concepts that were theoretically great on paper, but that didn't translate to performance on track and were quietly abandoned. In this video, we'll celebrate 10 examples of innovations that should have worked, but for various reasons, be it the technology not being advanced enough to exploit a fundamentally good idea, the concept being flawed, or the team simply not being able to make it work, failed. 10. Benetton Front Torque Transfer The Benetton B199 of 1999 featured what was effectively a front differential. Officially called the Front Torque Transfer System, or FTT for short, it was a simple idea designed to allow the drivers to be more aggressive under braking and in corner entries. A viscous coupling between the front wheels, developed in association with X-Track, allowed there to be a difference in wheel speed across the front axle. If correctly set up, that meant it was harder to lock the inside front wheel and more progressive if lockups did occur. However, this differential was large, requiring a longer wheelbase for the car and adding weight, compromises that added up to a negative impact on some circuits. However, on heavily braking dependent tracks, it was reckoned to be worth several tenths of a second. But overall, the design, along with other innovations such as the twin clutch gearbox, proved troublesome, according to technical director Pat Simmons, thanks to what he called fundamental mechanical problems. Benetton dropped the design. In 2004, BAR developed a variation on this system that worked well, but that was ultimately banned. 9. McLaren's Midwing When the angular and ultimately unsuccessful McLaren MP410 launched in 1995, the narrow wing mounted on the engine cover was the big talking point. Although some questioned its legality, the regulations clearly allowed bodywork in this area 25cm either side of the centreline of the car. As team principal Ron Dennis said, it wasn't a grey area, but its positioning needed to be precise. The trouble is that while this engine cover wing produced downforce, it wasn't very efficient and disrupted the airflow to the rear of the car. The McLaren suffered all sorts of aerodynamic troubles in testing, and there were even rumours the winglet would be dropped for the season opening Brazilian Grand Prix. McLaren persevered with it, using it for the first five races, but thereafter it was only raced in the Hungarian and Pacific Grand Prix on high downforce circuits, and the car was close to its worst at high downforce Barcelona, Monaco and Aida. Others experimented with a similar design, notably Jordan in 1996, but even before the design was banned, the engine cover wings never really worked. 8. Six Wheelers The famous Tyrrell P34 wasn't exactly a failure, given Jody Schechter and Patrick Depaye took a famous 1-2 in the 1976 Swedish Grand Prix. But it was a tricky car to get the best out of that never fulfilled the potential of the concept. The idea was to run four smaller front wheels, which would cut lift and drag while generating good levels of grip. But Tyrrell struggled to get the best out of the car partly because Goodyear put limited time and money into developing the tyres on 10-inch wheel rims for the sole customer needing them. What's more, you could lock the two front axles independently in a car that was very difficult to set up to be consistent. No less a driver than Ronnie Peterson struggled with it when he raced it in 1977, and Schechter found it tricky under braking and unreliable, despite it also having some positive handling characteristics. Six wheelers had potential, and both Williams and March later experimented with the idea, albeit with four driven wheels at the rear. But before anyone else could race a six-wheeler, F1 banned them for 1983. 7. Renault's Wide-Angle V10 When Renault returned to Formula 1 as an engine supplier in 2001, technical director Jean-Jacques Hiss opted for a bold wide-angle configuration. The idea was that this would be a packaging and centre of gravity gain compared to the conventional 90-degree V-angle favoured by rivals such as Ferrari. But such a configuration comes with its negatives. Vibrations were the big challenge, with conventional wisdom arguing it wouldn't be possible to make such an engine reliable as a result. That's something Renault attempted to tackle using what it called artificial techniques. To its credit, Renault made good progress during the three seasons it ran this engine concept. It claimed a pole position and a victory in 2003 in the hands of Fernando Alonso, although reliability was still questionable. 
With F1's regulations meaning that one engine had to last a full weekend in 2004, Renault switched to a more conventional design in order to achieve the necessary reliability, reverting to the 72 degree angle it had used with its previous engine. 6. Four wheel drive Formula One banned four wheel drive in 1983, but that was more than a decade after the short lived craze for such cars. The Ferguson P99 was the first, and yes, that's Ferguson as in Harry Ferguson, founder of the famous British tractor manufacturer. The car only raced once in the World Championship at Silverstone in 1961, but it also became the only four wheel drive car to win an F1 race, the Alton Park Gold Cup, driven by Sterling Moss, who was complimentary about the handling of the front engine car. Lotus also ran two four-wheel drive F1 cars, the Lotus 63 in 1969 and the Lotus 56B two years later. We'll hear more about the 56B later in this video. Matra also produced an evolution of its 1969 championship winning car, the MS84, which scored a world championship point in the Canadian Grand Prix. But the fact Johnny Servoz Gavin finished six laps down tells you everything you need to know about that car. McLaren had a go with the ill-handling M9A, raced unsuccessfully by Derek Bell in the 1969 British Grand Prix. None of the cars really worked, and all were quickly dropped. Progress is a race that has no end. After every finish line, another challenge awaits. How can Aramco continue to push innovation in a sport at the forefront of technology? This is how. Discover how Aramco and the Aston Martin Formula One team aim to meet Formula One's sustainable fuel targets. Aramco. Powered by how. Five forward-facing exhausts. Exhaust blowing took F1 by storm in 2010, with Red Bull successfully blowing the diffuser. But Renault took it one step further by asking, what if you use the high-speed exhaust gas flow to energize the whole floor? Through some tortuous design work initially in CFD, Renault hit on a concept that worked and produced very encouraging results. Although it cost a little power, the belief was that the downforce improvement meant a net gain. But two factors worked against it. F1 switch to Pirelli rubber in 2011 meant tyres with dramatically different characteristics. They demanded the maximising of rear downforce to mitigate the struggles for rear grip under lateral load and traction. Renault also assumed there was plenty more performance to extract from the concept through further developments, but unfortunately there wasn't. So Renault started the season well but slid off the pace as it was pushing up against a development ceiling. Even if F1 hadn't changed the rules to ban forward exhausts, Renault would have reverted to a conventional design in 2012. 4. Passive F ducts and the double DRS the F-Duct was pioneered by McLaren in 2010 and quickly copied by rivals. But the FIA banned the designs in 2011, meaning the driver could no longer operate an aerodynamic switch that stalled the rear wing. But teams realised there was potential to have a similar effect either passively or in harness with the deployment of the DRS, which was introduced in 2011. Mercedes was the first to introduce the concept with its W-duct late in 2011. The slot in the nose of the car channeled airflow down the front wing support pillars to blow across the front wing, creating a stall effect. With the FIA not allowing the duct in the nose to be used for this in 2012, Mercedes created a double DRS concept, whereby air taken in by slots in the front wing was channeled to the rear of the car and blew across the rear wing when the DRS was open. But the passive F-duct design Lotus experimented with from the 2012 German Grand Prix onwards was the most interesting and unsuccessful idea. Airflow fed from the airbox was channeled out of the back of the car, but a fluidic switch redirected this up the rear wing pylon to blow the rear wing at high speed. The trick was tuning this switch to activate at the right speed so you didn't lose downforce in corners. Lotus hoped to make the system work, but was never able to get it right. 3. Turbine Engines Theoretically, gas turbine engines had great potential in Formula 1, given they can be high revving, powerful and compact. But only Team Lotus tried it in F1 back in 1971, and while they remained legal for a long time, they are outlawed under modern F1 regulations. The Pratt & Whitney gas turbine engine made a big impact at Indianapolis in 1967 in Andy Granatelli's STP machine driven by Pinelli Jones, before Lotus adopted the Pratt & Whitney engine for an attack on Indy in 1968 in the Lotus 56, a car I photographed at Indianapolis airport earlier this year. 
1971, a 56 was adapted for use in F1. It raced three times in World Championship events, and seven times in total, finishing no higher than eighth. Lotus decided not to persevere with the engine, despite the belief it might have excelled in a more conventional car, and never again was a turbine engine seen in Formula 1. 2. The Walrus Nose when it was launched, the Williams FW26 was hailed as a radical car that could take the fight to all-conquering Ferrari in 2004, and the most eye-catching feature of the car was the walrus nose. Aerodynamicist Antonia Terzi came up with the concept. At the launch, Williams co-founder Patrick Head explained that the wide nose would allow the maximum airflow to the front of the floor. The only downside was supposed to be weight. Unfortunately, the aerodynamic benefit of the increased airflow between the nose pillars was relatively small, while the disadvantages, including the fact that it was sensitive to crosswinds thanks to the shape of those pillars, were significant. In short, it made the front wing work slightly better, but it was overly sensitive and compromised other aspects of the car. The walrus nose lasted just 12 races before it was replaced with a conventional design. 1. McLaren's Monstrous Exhaust in 2011, McLaren believed it had found a way to make the most of the potential of exhaust blown aero. The result was the infamous octopus exhaust, actually known internally either as the fantail or bagpipe exhaust. The idea was simple. The elaborate shapes of the exhaust came together into a single wide outlet that blew the floor directly. The tortuous shape was the result of needing to meet various regulation demands. Unfortunately, it didn't prove reliable, on top of causing aerodynamic problems, and having already skipped the first pre-season test, McLaren struggled for mileage. Worse was to come, as the switch late in testing to a more conventional exhaust proved even less reliable. Sam Michael, then at Williams, later saw the exhaust design having joined McLaren as sporting director, describing it as a monster. But he also pointed out that while it proved horrendous, the idea was great conceptually. McLaren turned up for the first race in Australia with an entirely new design, a clear copy of the Red Bull concept, and it worked well, with the team winning six times in 2011. Thanks for watching F1 Technical Analysis, brought to you by Aramco.